Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. I'm Leslie Rollins, uh, SDSA, and joining me here today are Claire Kaufman, SDSA, the set decorator, and the production designer, Jess Goncher. We are going to discuss their amazing creative collaboration on the offbeat black comedy for Netflix called White Noise. So Claire, Jess, welcome. Hi, Leslie. Thanks for having us. Yeah, oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, I wanted to start out um, just talking to you, Jess, first about how you came about doing this project. Where did it come from? And uh, how did you get involved? Yeah, well, I think it came from um, a couple of casual meetings with Noah when um, Claire and I were doing Little Women with with Greta and um, she had passed along. I guess he had, he had said, hey, I'm uh, adapting this book. I think Jess would be interested. And um, so he uh, he gave me a call and we talked for a little bit and I had not read the book um, and I read the script and I really identified with a, a lot of it in that time period and, uh, and, and the place where, you know, supposedly it took place and, um, and I was happy to, to get involved with it. It was also during the whole pandemic. So um, I feel like I was fortunate enough to be working on something and something that was um, so relatable to like what was going on in real life. Um, so anyway, long story was I got through, uh, I came to the project, I guess, through, uh, through, through Greta. Yeah. Claire, how did you get up mis mixed up in this whole thing? <laughs> well, you know, uh, like just said, we were doing Little Women together. And uh, when this came up, you know, I was fortunate enough to have Jess ask me to, to join. And I immediately had to read the book. I hadn't read it either. And, you know, it's just I love what Noah did with the, the screenplay and how he sort of took this monster of a book and really adapted it in such an amazing way. You know, people talk about, you know, it's an unfilmable book, but clearly it's not. <laughs> Let me ask you, did you find it, both of you really, did you find it useful to read the book before you made the movie? Yeah, I think anytime you have the backstory and the bigger story, it's uh, it's helpful. Um, you know, there, there's so many layers just to this family. Um, it's a little more, you know, there's more children and it's a little more involved when you read the book, but it really gives you the backstory to all these people. Right. And, and maybe some details that you might pick up on and be able to incorporate in your work. Definitely. Jess, this movie is about color. I, oh my God. It's just an amazing color story. Uh, how did that happen? And, and what was the concept there? You know, um, first of all, it's the most colorful thing I've worked on, you know, in, in, in the movies that I have designed and, um, uh, and who knows, it might be the most colorful ever. <laughs> um, well, you touching upon the, uh, the, the, the question that you just asked about, what do you, what do you get out of the book? And it's interesting, um, because I read the book and there and it's so descriptive, you know, down to you know Captain Crunch boxes to bags of cheese to it, like all of the, all of the things. So I think it helped me out with, um, you know, a, a lot of what uh, the author Delilah was was uh, going for with like des describing a time and a place without saying where the place was. So that was sort of interesting to me. My early conversations with Noah, I said, well, what, 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 you know, and everybody has a different idea what the supermarket uh, represents. Um, mm. But he said, I want it to be like some sort of a, a utopia. 
So then I, when I was doing a little bit of, of digging and going through the book, you know, DeLillo also describes it as a utopia of capitalism and consumerism. You know, and I think it was a revitalizing place full of wonder and, and significance where people become aware of their vibrancy. And there was so much suggested death in the book that I, I think that, you know, one of the things that, I mean, Murray says in the book, Americans don't die, they shop. So I latched onto that whole thing and decided that if everybody's cool with it, I think we should just make this a, a place of of things that don't die, you know, things that 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 are have a shelf life of, of forever and a very colorful utopia. And I think that Claire and Noah and and DP, I think if people were on board with with doing that, so that's sort of, sort of embrace the color and it's um. You know, and that would be like the most the, the colorful thing in, in the movie and all just all of the packaging and all of the the products that was just like, you know, like what Warhol was doing with the with the Campbell's soup can. And it was just everything to me was, you know, look, look like an, those shelves, like it was like an art installation. So anyway, I took that and I say this with every one of these interviews, but like the Rubik's cube was, was very influential in, you know, with just the shape and the color. And that was like a package inside a package because that's how grout lines and primary colors, and then a couple of secondary colors. And it was a very popular thing in the, in the eighties. Anyway, that's, that's like the color comes from the supermarket, a place of, you know, vi vibrance and, and revitalization and plasticity and, something that just you know lasts for forever and people can maybe you know identify with that and be be charged up in there that's where it comes from what struck me when i was watching the movie uh i've, I've only seen it twice but it seems to me that there is a rhythm that happens when you cut from one scene to the next there is something going on with the color that moves you forward as well and uh, I was quite uh, taken by that. Claire, may I ask you, how did this color concept affect your work, uh, what you were doing, uh, and, you know, supporting Jess's vision and, and creating these environments? You know, I was really lucky to have this amazing space to work out of. Um, we, I basically was able to arc the entire film from beginning to end um, and, you know, pin it up on a wall. Mm -hmm. So we really, and I remember walking through with Jess and Noah and, you know, we really got a sense of, you know, the palettes and the textures and the look for each set and how it was going to run its course through the entire movie, um, you know. And working off that idea that Jess mentioned, you know, the Rubik's Cube, you know, even the house, it's like every room has its own color palette within within the home, you know. Yes. Um, and I, so, um, you know, it was just really working, working to working to nail those colors and those those palettes for for each for each set. It seemed like every table in the movie had a. Uh something yellow in the middle. There was yellow and there was red. And those two colors were juxtaposed. You know, the, the kitchen table and then the tables in the uh, cafeteria. So I saw that you had brought those elements in and they were featured, you know, throughout. It was quite nice. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. How did you decide how the color was going to move through the movie. Did you start with one idea? And then as it progressed, I noticed when we get to the hospital, when we get to heaven, uh, it's almost, the, there's still color, but it is different. It is subdued. I love those hospital sheets with the flowers. Oh my God, that was brilliant. I love that. <laughs> Is that a really agreed upon idea? Or did you just spring it on people one day? <laughs> well, you know, that space was incredible. Um, you know, and Jess and I talked a lot about how, uh, you know, it was this, uh, you know, the layout, the temporary, it was to, to look temporary. So we bought all those uh, folding hospital screens. We 
ripped all the white plastic off of them and yeah. then, you know, did them in this sea green, which is incredible against Anne's lavender nuns. And it was just, you know, I really wanted this idea that it's um, this totally mismatched. Everything's donated. It's used hospital equipment, you know, the bedding's all donated. And that was the idea behind these mismatched. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's great. It is just great. Yeah. And, there's a good shot of it right there. Yeah. So it was just um, the, 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 the space itself was incredible. You know, when we first got in there, the walls were covered in this white plastic. Was it wallpaper, Jess, or something? I don't know. But, you know, they went in and we started, they stripped all this stuff away and all these beautiful frescoes and things appeared. And then Jess's cloud painting in the middle is mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, marvelous. Um, I noticed also one of the other places where there's a big color shift is in Mr. Gray's motel room. It didn't seem to be as colorful as the other sets. Of course, it was sort of dark in there. You know, what I loved, loved was the red toilet <laughs> and the red sink. Tell me, did you find that or did you have it painted? No, we, we glazed all those pieces to, yeah. to to work in that set. Well, I want one now. I've decided <laughs> I need to have a red toilet. I think it's worth mentioning that Claire, Noah, and myself, we talked a lot about, you know, you have the town of Blacksmith and the College on the Hill. And then, um, you know, in most, I don't know, in, in a lot of instances, you have a... Uh, a college and whatever, 10, 20 miles away, you have a big, you know, a, a city. And so we try to really differentiate between um, the college on the hill, the town of Blacksmith, and then Iron City, where that hospital was, where the motel was. So it really, it was like, you know, a much, it was like the equivalent of a uh, like Yale University and then going to New Haven. You know, New Haven can be quite sketchy and Yale is beautiful. It's like any of these things. If you go to, you know, where I went to school near Buffalo, New York, Buffalo is like super sketchy in the in the 80s. But the, the, the college that I went to was like, you know, beautiful and, and pristine. So it was like a, uh, a college campus supported. It's a small town supported by a, a big town. Uh, like Carnegie Mellon versus Pittsburgh. So I think it was important for us to get a um, a much more saturated primary color look, darker look, more aged look. And, and so when um, Babette goes to Iron City, it means something. It's a little bit, it's a little bit scarier than her, you know, what's supposed to be her comfortable, you know, college town life. Now, did you build this motel facade? We did. And we looked around and looked around and, um, you know, I think Noah's uh, initial idea was we find a location. And I was really hoping the whole time that we could build it. It took a long time for everybody to agree that it would be worth building this. But anyway, um, we ended up building it and I think it was the right thing to do. What other big sets that did you end up building that you thought you were going to use locations for? I mean, we built a lot um we built yeah. all three floors of the of the house the first floor the second floor the attic uh the attic was you know always maybe thought as as a location but um we ended up building that it was easier um i mean i guess i guess the big one was the supermarket can you can you you know essentially i'm just i'm just going to call that a build on a stage because we had an empty shell and and you know like the motel sort of you know built you know built that from from the ground up that the, the place where we shot the supermarket was no different from the stage that the the empty kmart kmart or walmart i forget um that walmart. we used walmart that we a super walmart that we used in cleveland so yeah we looked for a very long time mm -hmm. for a supermarket so i think that you know that was that was something that might have been a location and was it a location? I guess so, because it was in a building and it wasn't attached to our stage, but it was exactly like the stage, uh, everything about it. And Claire was able to like, I don't know, even know how she did it, but. Uh, Claire, it your supermarket shelving is wonderful. When I was watching the movie, I was miles of shelving. 
That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Jess is correct. It, it it really is a set because, you know, even we went in there and figured out how to kind of contain the space. You know, we did all the aisles to work for us. Um, you know, and it, and it was daunting in the beginning because it was this totally empty space. But in hindsight, I'm so glad because it just totally gave us the freedom to pick and choose the product layout you know i'm not having to try and make something work that was there so and it, it was this idea for me that each gondola is four foot wide and it's this repetition of these products you know sometimes we take one product and do it in three different colors and so you just get these blocks of graphic going on you know and the end caps were such a great way to to display products of the time Obviously, you had cooperation of the uh, of the manufacturers, the vendors. You know, you were able to use Pringles, for instance, and all of that. Well, I mean, Netflix is really, for me, the best company to work when it comes to clearance and stuff. You know, it was this idea that we're never going to clear every single product in the supermarket, but. Yeah. You know, it always harkens back to this thing that I've heard for years that, you know, if there's eight or more like products and you're not using them in a, in a, in a, you know, to murder someone. Right. Yeah. You know, that it's just, it's, it's the background, it's the life and everything, you know, we manufactured so much. I just had this, you know, assembly line of people for weeks on end wrapping and making products and. Uh, every label created was every product covering cans and a great majority of them were manufactured all the uncaps are manufactured um, are they wow yeah, yeah. you know like we, we, the pringles display for instance i know we're getting down into some nitty-gritty but you know that's what septic raiders do uh the the pringles in cap for instance which we're looking at did you have to create all of the labels for those pringle cans oh yeah absolutely yeah literally every end cap we manufactured i think we had you know like in the chip and soda aisle i think we had something like five thousand chip bags printed and thousands of soda cans and we actually the, the cans are actually i think some weird japanese drink so that they had just the right look and the the pull uh -huh. tops and all that kind of stuff the the leader bottles we took every white plastic cap off and put a you know a silver aluminum cap on because that's what they were in the 80s. So it was, you know, making sure every detail is was period correct in there. Yeah, it is an incredibly detailed, not just this set, but every set is so detailed. Um, did you, how much of this was visual effects, the supermarket? Uh, you know, I think, just maybe help me out here, but I, I was, we dressed something like 6,700 linear feet of shelving, you know, even when they come around and do that big high wide, you know, yeah. almost 85% of that is practical. That one shot that I think Claire's describing where they, they it's like a, a side profile shot. Um, there's a little bit of set extension, but I got to tell you, not, not much. <laughs> we gave them a giant set it was and you know it was just one of these things that you you start working on it and we had a you know we were fortunate to have a pretty long leash of like you know having that location and just starting it and just you know i mean because it, it, something like that can never be done we we could still be working on it you know what i mean so uh, <laughs> but um but very little of it uh was set extension not that right. much and yeah, that looked like a picture of it, and it's. We were still dressing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, setting the shelves was probably the hardest thing to do in there. <laughs> you know, it was literally like a math equation, like taking products. You know, I taped out every gondola, like this is going to be this, and this is going to be this, and you know, stacking things and setting the shelves so everything fit just correctly. And then everything is, uh, you know, at least two, two products deep. So if someone took something off the shelf, obviously there'd be something behind. Right. Obviously this movie had an enormous graphics department just for the supermarket alone, but every set had uh, graphics work, it seemed to me. And did you have your own graphics team player or did everybody share? 
we shared. Yeah, they uh, and and you know it, it wasn't it wasn't a giant graphics team. It was just you know they uh, yeah. one of the graphics person had made this incredible kind of uh, lookbook for me of you know all products of the eighties. So mm-hmm. we would work backwards from that, and you know I'd pick and choose the things that we wanted to to feature. Yeah, and say make three thousand. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, just the, the strips on the shelving that say A&P. I was like, more strips. We need more strips. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Gladney's house for just a moment. Um, I was struck, as you mentioned earlier, by the uh, every room had its own color story. And the the most striking ones to me, to, the, to me as a viewer, was uh, Jack in Baba's bedroom with that sort of blue and purple uh, colorway that was going on there. And then the the white furniture or the light colored furniture, I should say. And that is the most amazing headboard. I mean, now did you find that or did you make it? No, Jess, uh, Jess had a picture of something very similar and we, we had that manufactured. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I worked from this idea that, you know, Jack has lived in this house for at least 16 years. He's been through all these marriages, but I, you know, and there's all these layers, but, you know, there's the old and the new. And the idea for this bedroom was, is that, you know, the wallpaper's old, the drapery's old, but then Jack and Bob- Bobette went out and bought this, you know, brand new bedroom set for their new marriage, you know, mm. 80s bedroom set for, for themselves. Right. Uh, and then Denise's room. Oh my God. <laughs> when you cut to Denise's room, it's like a wake up call. <laughs> so he goes in and wakes her up. That was something throughout the house, the wallpapers were uh, amazing. Did you make all of those or were they, there you go. It was a, you know, it's a, it was a mix. We did manufacture uh, Denise's bedroom wallpaper. Uh, Noah and I had talked about, he came to me and he said, I really want uh, Denise to feel like she's in this field of flowers. And I looked at tons of wallpaper and Jess and I would looked at a lot of stuff together and just nothing was working. And I uh, <clears throat> found that, that bed sheet set. And I was like, you know, it it, uh, it harkened back to a bedroom that I actually had growing up that, you know, the, the bed, the wallpaper and the drapery all matched with the one kind of random music poster on the wall. So, uh, yeah, we manufactured that one. But most of the other wallpapers we we pulled from Aztec. But, but it's also maybe worth mentioning that if, if we if we pulled it. We adjusted the color on it for sure. Did you add details to the wallpaper or a different color? Or did you have it printed? We printed it, um, different colors, and then they also added a glaze to it and, uh, you know, highlights and low lights just to bring it to life, so. And I I don't know, you. the house was a location, right? The exterior, did you shoot interior that house? We did not. This house was in Oberlin, which is, you know, a really good template for what, you know, maybe make, we actually tried to shoot at Oberlin College, but they they um they weren't having it. it they weren't interested. But no, yeah. this was a house. A uh, a professor uh you know lived in there. I don't know how I don't know how long ago. Different people live in there now, but it was like it was perfect because it was like where a a university professor actually once lived. And you know one of the main criteria for the house was that they go on the roof with binoculars and look at the uh toxic event and the train and the train crash um so we looked at so many houses that might be that might be right and also have you know somewhere to go out on the roof and you know which way is the roof facing so finally i was like you know what this this house is amazing i don't i don't think we should um give up on it i loved uh i loved everything about it so we ended up building um this little bump out on the side that they could get out on so that like a piece of scenery so and then we then we duplicated that on stage so the actors could do it this couple of stunt people went out on on this particular one so that was a real a real house and then the interiors were all built 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Including the garage even. Yeah. Yeah. It's just great. I love the layering of the details, the possessions, people's things, the books. Uh, it all has a very lived in look. In fact, and I thought that about all of the sets, the German teacher's apartment. Oh my God, I love that place. You couldn't tell if he was a serial killer or a German teacher. <laughs> right. Yeah. He had yeah, a lot I know. We, we talked a lot about this house, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Jack's been there for at least 16 years. He's been through these marriages. He's got all these mm -hmm. kids and it was really about making it a vessel for all of their lives, you know, um, I, and I love, you know, how just designed like part of the kitchen would had been redone. And then the back half is, you know, the storage and the play area for Wilder and the laundry line. And, um, you know, and we and we also talked about how the kitchen was really an extension of the supermarket. You know, it's just uh, full of product and full of life. Um, speaking of the garage, which you'd mentioned earlier. Oh, my God. Uh, Having done many sort of garages and storerooms and things in my checkered past, I know what kind of job that is. It was really wonderful. Uh, you approached it just from a totally real, authentic point of view. You know, it wasn't stylized, at least to my eye, in the way that, um, you know, in a way the college is sort of a stylized interior. The, you know, the lecture, uh, Murphy's um, lecture room and the cafeteria and so on. Um, how did you do all that garbage? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, at that point, we'd actually done the supermarket, so we had plenty of product to play with. Oh, all right. Yes. But, you know, on the flip side of that, we actually, you know, we originally bought a trash compactor and we were literally you know, I think in the end we ended up getting some help from the effects department, but yeah, you know, it was just making, you know, it, I, I, we curating, curating garbage was a, a big part of that movie. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, you have a good eye for garbage too. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think you really see this in the movie, but the, when, uh, you know, when Babette throws the pill bottle in that, in that garbage, it's really one of those, you know, 70s it's a garbage compactor and it is a trash compactor okay yeah and and the idea um so if you see jack you know i, I was like fascinated with these cubes of garbage and i was like this is you know it's 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 insanity i i love it and um so when when jack goes into the garage and it's all sorts of garbage a lot of it is like like throwing down a bag of cement and just like you know tearing tearing into it with with a shovel and seeing all the like Claire said, the garbage that um, that we had compacted from the supermarket, and um, um, so yeah, it was. Uh, and it was you're right; it was not as stylized. It was you know, it was sort of like behind the curtain, you know, if you will. It was but the backstage of like of, the attic in a way, because exactly. the attic was very real. I what I loved about it, what I noticed, of course, was the of course was all the pink insulation. And that creates its own color uh, in that room, you know. Right. Well, that's something that's definitely in the book and in the script. It just, oh, yeah. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. Pink insulation. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Was that Heinrich's hangout? Was that the idea? Yes. You no, know, uh, yeah, kind of a, escape from the family and, and have a place to to be. And, you know, for me, shopping was amazing in, in Cleveland and, you know, we would literally be going and to estate sales and, you know, pulling, yeah. pulling carpets out of people's dens that they didn't want anymore. So it was really trying to find that, um, you know, that attention to detail that you, you know, Noah said in the very beginning, he never wanted to walk on a set and question if anything was period correct or, you know, or, mm. and I never wanted anyone to walk on a set and didn't believe that they were standing in the garage. You know, it's that. Uh, oh, sure. Sure. Know. Well, you did a beautiful job. 
and the I love the idea of the backstage areas of the house, the attic and the garage. Uh, as Jess said, that was that's a great description of that because it is slightly in a different. It is in a different style from the rest of the house, you know. All right, let's talk about this supermarket one more time. So, Jess, this was a Walmart, obviously, and you had to turn it into an A and P, and this is the style of the old A and P stores. Right. Well, this was not this was not the Walmart. It was um, I it's, it was in Bedford. I I don't know the name of the store. It escapes me. But it was like a like a a Target type of place where they they were at one time sold, you know, clothing and like you know, a department store, like a mini department store. Um. So yeah. So that's what it was. This was from the A and P up. They this is a piece of concept art. Visual effects put the roof on there. But we put the signage up and, you know, and, and everything else. And obviously period cars, which was a huge job in this movie. And uh, Bobby Griffin, our car guy, guy was, was amazing what he did. Oh, but, Bobby Griffin. Um, yeah. You know, I know him well from New York. Yeah, right. He's, he's, he's fantastic. So the supermarket, where did that shoot in your schedule? It was deep into the schedule. Um, yeah. Yeah, we so, had about six weeks to dress that set, which was great. And like just said earlier, <laughs> I could have used another six weeks, but or yes. you know, that, that would never be even longer. But we we worked on it, you know. We were building and painting for months on that thing, you know. It had to be three months or something. Jess, what about this train crash? Uh, how much of that was there? Any practical part to it? Yes, there was. Um, I mean, it. That thing was like a whole. As you know, it's very hard to work on train tracks at all. So we had to find a um, a private track that you know would allow it to be shut down for you know a couple of months at a time. The tractor trailer was on a was on a wire, and that was pulled up and up and down this the intersection. But and the train, you know, we we decided to go go for it, like give it you know one one shot and. Uh, actually just rammed pulled this tractor trailer through a moving train <laughs> um you know it was it was empty of any uh any toxic you know or, or flammable um waste or anything but um so it kind of did what it did we just want we also wanted to do this like maybe how they they were going to do it you know in the 80s with um not a ton of visual effects so so you could see there, you know, where, uh, you know, some of it takes over. And, um, but, you know, I'm going to say 65% of it's real. And, uh, and certainly all of the, the aftermath and the explosions and, um, you know, and, and all of those sort of things. So, I mean, it's really, when you, you know, the train, the, these train th cars, these tankers are so simple. They're these 60 foot cylindrical tubes 12 feet in diameter and they're not even and they're and they sit on cradles so they, they're not even attached so we were hoping really? yeah wow. they're not even attached gravity holds them down so they can pick them up and move them around from thing and do all sorts of stuff i mean they're very i mean you need cranes um so yeah. it's like it's pretty like simple math like boom let's let's see and um so it happened one of the impressive visual uh, things in the train crash is the way the cars accordion side by side you mm -hmm. know uh did you all have to help that along or yeah we we did we we did i mean you know that was like another setup in you know on the tracks there where we where we had the the the, the tankers wired together and they would close and open and they shot that and then added some so yeah, well, I think we had to help everything along. Understanding the whole time that it was going to be intercut with this dual lecture, um, just keeping that in the back of our minds about what would help out this lecture. It really wasn't how could this lecture help out this crash. It was like how could this, you know, the, the crash was sort of secondary to what was going on in that classroom. One of the um, things that struck me uh, is the black cloud. Uh, it it 
it's almost it's almost an animal it's almost a, a character in the story in the way that the cloud evolves um throughout uh did you design that cloud was that an illustration that was then translated to visual effects yeah it was um and also that was um it came from all, so many places you know like even back to the Ten Commandments, the angel of, of death, you know, like I, I felt like I, you know, when you see it at the gas station, it's like a slow moving gas. And I know that Noah wanted it to be, you know, alive and, and something swirling inside of it and, and you know, exploding inside of it. So you so what you're saying is true. It had a life of its own and it, it you know, it was live and it, you wanted to see that it had a movement and change direction with the wind and sort of ha have a rhythm to it as well. So, yeah, we did a bunch of concept art and then effects did a great job and visual effects. And it was a lot that a lot that went into it. And then again, you know, like, you know, for me, when I after I'm, you know, this movie came out, I already done another movie. So it's very interesting to see like the end product. You know, I'm always. I'm always really surprised that um, a lot of times I'm very involved um, and I, and I was at this, but I was definitely a few months of, uh, don't, I didn't know, you know, what was really, it was going to be like until I saw it, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. The big traffic jam, that whole sequence with the car and the creek <laughs> and the flying through the air and landing and driving through the cornfield and there they are and then they're in this traffic jam um looking for gas you know the whole thing and then that crash in the traffic jam uh where the cars crashes and it rips aside off of a winnebago and all of that that was a great set yeah I forget, we, uh, I forget what we dress like 100 and 200 cars, you know, stuff on the roof, stuff inside. Where did you ever find the time? <laughs> <laughs> no, and, it, and it's and it's true because oftentimes those things get ne neglected, but Claire and, and team were able to just, they would show up with truckloads full of, you know, everything from giant boxes of uh cornflakes you know from the supermarket to laundry hampers to furniture and you know we and, and a lot of that i can let you talk about it but a lot of that um like you saw it in the beginning of the movie when the kids were getting dropped off on the station wagons um yeah. and she had found some incredible you know c colors of things and you really got to see like if one was a you know a teenage girl getting out or somebody was preppy or somebody was sporty um she really got the um the information on the on the roof of the station wagons was uh was was amazing and then the same with like what do you take what kind of do you take your your cat box or something like what are you taking an evacuation and bringing all of that stuff into the army the boy scout barracks as well too so it was like you know i think you really got to see what claire got across was what you know what um you know, all, 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 what would you take in an evacuation and um, yeah, hammer ties through that movie. It was incredible with the stuff she got. You know, I mean, it even, uh, you know, like just said in the beginning, it was, you know, we even were curating suitcases so that, you know, the, mm -hmm. the school and all of the belongings and all the stuff the kids are bringing to college has one palette. And then everything we did out on the highway, you know, we really tried to give that a, a different palette. It's, you know, this it's chaotic and it's, you know, just madness out there. And, and again, just having the right details, like each car has a personality. When you talk about the set decorating of the movie and I've, you know, I don't know how many movies I've designed now, but a lot and I've worked with a lot of people and, um, and I've noticed that there's a couple of ways of approaching um, a movie, uh, a, a movie, especially on location. And that's sometimes that, um, you know, people shop for each environment, you know, specifically and say, oh, this is the bedroom. This is the garage. This is the thing. And, and which is great. Um, but, and then, and then there's the other, then the other, then there's the other thing of like, this is 1985 and, you know, let's go out there and like, I, like what Claire said, like from the beginning, she's like, 
look at this. I got these great suitcases. And I'm like, well, yeah, what is that for? But it's like, well, we're going to use it somewhere. We, you like, you know, in your mind, you're thinking about the whole movie and you're in a place that's got a lot of great stuff like, you know, Ohio or, you know, some of the other Rust Belt states around there that would supposedly this took place just to, um, to get all that stuff. And you just like, I'm, I'm assuming just inspired by what's out there and just start to collect um, a look for the movie. And then I would go into the, to the warehouse and go, wow, this is great. Whether it's a, a neon sign, a suitcase, uh, a piece of antiquated uh, doctor's equipment or something like that. So I was really, it was, it was impressive what, what, what she was able to do um, filling this place and you could go in there and see things and know it could go in there. I know everybody does it that's the thing you get a warehouse and you know you have all your stuff in there but but um but anyway i've seen it done a few different ways and i th i think that just um you know getting things that are are in one little thing that can inspire you know a, a, a scene you know instead of like breaking it down so methodically is great claire did you tell me about your shopping and buying did you have um a whole bunch of buyers <laughs> did you shop other states did you go to la or new york we we pulled very little from la uh mainly um street lights and things that i was worried like the the lights outside the motel things that might be hard to find or multiples of um and and just as correct it's it was just really i had two buyers um and we just uh we shopped and we just curated this warehouse and, you know, things come in and, you know, you have an idea of what you're looking for for each set, but, you know, Jess is correct. We'd be, I would be so inspired by going through these antique malls and I would just up and down every single aisle and every single cabinet and just finding these amazing treasures. And then you get it back to the warehouse and then, you know, I, I, put together each set. So you have a real sense of what it's going to be, even when it's just sitting in a pile. The scout camp. Um, I, when I was watching the movie, that totem pole, I thought, oh, wait a minute. Uh, certainly that was not at the location. Beautifully done, really nice. They make it, it makes a nice entrance and it's a great sort of view coming into the camp that the kids are looking at. Now, was that an actual camp of some sort? Was there a building there or did you build that? No, there was a building. It was it was actually uh it was a boy scout, it is a boy scout camp. And you know, again, it's one thing Claire just started collecting. I mean, there was I don't know how many temporary cots, beds were in there, and, and air, all of those chairs, coolers, radios, clothing, you know, all the artifacts around there. Um, but the building was there and then um obviously we you know we did a lot of work to it all the lighting all the tents all the i mean yeah. cars the you know i mean again this was supposed to hopefully be you know very you know spielberg um 80s type of uh a vibe claire in the forgive me if i get this backward there are two refugee shelters that we see in uh, the movie we have the boy scout camp and then they go to something that appears to be more urban or yes. like an old warehouse uh, it was actually a karate studio a karate studio okay uh and there were some practicals hanging overhead uh and then you so you had to have cots and the whole thing here or did were there people just bringing their own things oh no we we dressed this space as well you know um we did the boy scout camp first and then we moved on to this space you know when they wake up in the morning and it's just chaos out there <laughs> it's like every day i'm getting phone calls we need more tents we need more cots <laughs> <laughs> it was uh you know complete madness um but yeah it was uh it, again just you know what what did they grab what did they you know yeah of course them, so 
yeah. Just that orange MRI is just a fantastic set piece. Um, I've been in an MRI, and believe me, I know they don't look anything like that. Right. It wow. was. It was. I hope they do someday. The fact that it was orange with those. Uh, it ended up being encased in concrete walls, kind of a brutalist thing, as I recall, around it. There was like five other sets like this. In, in the, originally, he had Noah had Jack going through a series of, of tests and these technicians were studying him. We had like five different sort of apparatuses like this that were equally as crazy. Yeah, we just, you know, you could have gone two ways with this. You could have gone like, Oh, Autumn Harvest Farms, it's got the state-of-the-art equipment, and then it was just, you know, a bunch of old antiquated stuff from the from the 50s, you know. Mm-hmm. But we decided to embrace the times. And this was, um, I was looking at uh, the first MRI machine, which came out in 1980 in Germany, and it pretty much looked like this piece that we put. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, obviously they've evolved from there. We just wanted to make it like, you know, of the time, but also like a very sort of scary thing. Because, you know, getting an MRI is like, you know, I've 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 actually split from a couple of those. I'd be like, no, nope, nope, not going in this tube today. That's going in there. Can't, can't do. But anyway, so and then Claire was able to get all. I mean, I wish you did see the other ones because the amount of uh, knobs, dials, switches, lights screens appliques were um like amazing what they got um yeah yeah, the idea was just to to go in some like brutalist type of thing that was juxtaposed to that other uh the local doc the local blacksmith doctor from uh you see earlier on right well it was great um we talked about the um hospital the german nuns i love that whole environment that was really a marvelous take you know on an emergency room i mean yeah it was an emergency all right but for different reasons uh it was just a great take on that idea and i suppose that comes from the book right and therefore from the script the set is but you know like just said earlier for you know for as long as the book is a lot of it there there isn't a lot of description for some of these spaces so there was a freedom to you know um my favorite part of this set is actually the uh just came up with this idea for these cages for the, the the drunk and disorderly on the right there and i loved i loved that idea <laughs> Uh, Jess, I'm assuming you built the creek. Yeah, we did. We, it was that was quite a project too. But we uh, there there was a, a, again ideas at the beginning that we were going to find a creek, and obviously that was just not feasible for special effects or to get mechanics in there. But yeah, so we ended up finding a a, a place outside of Ohio about 45 minutes and digging it and lining it with asphalt and putting all the rigs in there and then filling it with water. And originally it was supposed to be a night scene that so was much more forgiving. And then all of a sudden, like he changed it to day and we were halfway through and I was like, wow, what is this going to still work? But I think it did. It, oh, it works totally. I mean, you totally believe that uh, exactly what you're being shown on the screen. There's no reason not to believe it. And I think the fact that it took place during the day was actually pretty good. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah. You're able to see it. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, I hope we've had a chance to talk about a number of things and give our viewers a good idea of what goes into uh, to making this kind of a movie, or this one specifically, actually. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk to both of you. Yep. Uh, Jess, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Take care. Claire, thank pleasure you. see you both again. And uh, thank you all very much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.